Good morning on behalf of the WVU Center for Community Engagement. We are so glad you are joining us for this academic community engagement. ACE event. The ACE development series aims to increase the breadth and quality of academic community engagement at WVU. Our intentions are that through presentation and discussion, attendees of the ACE series will learn how to get started or enhance what they are already doing and connect to a network of peers and resources. Today's presentation is called, What Do We Mean by Civic Engagement? My name is Melissa Calabrese and I am the Academic Community Engagement Co Coordinator with the Center for Community Engagement. To make our time together more intimate, you're invited to say hello in the chat right now and share what department or organization you're representing today. And speaking of time, we're here together for the next 50 minutes to share some best practices and ask questions about civic engagement within higher education, including how we might be able to nurture holistic ways of thinking, learning, and collaborating. I encourage you to engage in whatever way feels right to you, including turning on your camera and asking questions, using the chat, and or making use of the Zoom emojis. Many of my colleagues know that I am a fan of the heart emoji, so I will demonstrate right now. <laughs> There's my heart. Um, so thanks, I see uh, folks are using the chat. We love that. Um, we can encourage you to continue to do the same. This conversation will be recorded and shared with registered participants and will be added to our ACE library on our website. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Cheyenne Luzinski as a moderator of today's ACE panel. She received her doctorate in educational leadership with an emphasis in higher education and student affairs from Eastern Michigan University. Cheyenne has been involved with leadership education and leadership development for over 20 years. Teaching in the leadership studies, she facilitates leadership learning through complex problem solving and reflective practices. Creating a culture where critical thinking, engaging dialogue and moral imagination occurs and addresses social issues. In addition to teaching, she serves as the advisor to Milan Pusker Leadership Scholars, is a certified Gallup Strengths Coach, a trained mental health coach, and is actively involved in equity and fairness issues in West Virginia with West Virginia National Organization for Women. She participated in the 2024 Teaching Social Action Institute and incorporates elements of service learning, social action, and civic engagement within her classes. Her commitment to issues of equity and culture within higher education organizations underscores her dedication to driving positive change. Cheyenne's presence promises to elevate our discussion today, offering valuable insights and fostering meaningful dialogue. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Cheyenne Lusinski. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I'm really looking forward to this talk and joining these champions for civic engagement. And so let me begin by introducing the three panelists that we have with us today. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Shaniqua Williams, Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science at West Virginia University. She's a distinguished panelist joining us from, well, hailing proudly from San Diego, California. Shaniqua is a scholar whose academic journey led her to Auburn University, where she attained her MPA along with a graduate certificate in election administration in 2018, followed by her doctorate in public administration and public policy. Dr. Shaniqua Williams' research delves deeply into the intersections of state politics, race, and ethnicity, particularly focusing on Black political behavior and Black women's descriptive and substantive representation. Her groundbreaking dissertation titled The Backbone of Democracy, a study examining the impacts of Black women in politics, employs an intersectional lens to explore the vital role of Black women in state legislatures and its impact on democratic norms. Beyond her scholarly pursuits, Shaniqua is deeply committed to fostering inclusivity and empowering students and community members to address both immediate and systemic challenges. She actively seeks to collaborate with the WVU campus community and external institutions to develop strategies for recruiting and retaining individuals in under, from underrepresented groups in political science and public administration. With her expertise and passion for inclusivity and commitment to civic engagement, Dr. Shaniqua Williams brings a wealth of knowledge and perspective to our panel discussion today. So we're happy to have you join us. 
Next, we have uh, Dr. James Kotkan. James' academic journey is marked by a relentless pursuit of understanding and addressing key issues in agriculture and um, environmental sustainability. He joins us from the Davis College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. He has a bachelor's degree in science and um, in biology from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, a master's in science of plant pathology from Michigan State University, and a doctorate in plant pathology from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Dr. Katkan has garnered a wealth of expertise in his field. His research interests encompass a wide range of topics, including organic farming systems, agricultural pest, environmental impacts on pesticides, and much more. James strives to find sustainable solutions to complex challenges facing modern agriculture and environment. In addition to his in research endeavors, Dr. Katkan is deeply involved in education, teaching courses on principles of agroecology, sustainable living, plant sciences, organic crop production, environmental impact assessment, and nematology. His commitment to sustainability extends well beyond academia, and he is a proud member of Morgantown's Green Team, where he actively contributes to local initiatives aimed at promoting environmental cons conservation, civic engagement, and awareness. So with his extensive um, knowledge and sustainability, we welcome James Katkan to this conversation as well. And next we have Mason Abergast and um, Melissa from the printout that I have and not able to access my computer at the time. I do not have Mason's intro. So do you mind introducing him? Thank you. It would be my pleasure. Um, and I will pull it up right now. <laughs> Mason Arbogast is the Youth Protection Program Specialist with the Office of Equity Assurance within the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. In his role, Mason works closely with the WV Board of Governors Rule 1.7 to ensure the safety and well-being of youth participating on university premises or in university-sponsored programming through training guidelines for supervision and by acting as a resource to members of the university community who may be experiencing child abuse or neglect. Prior to joining DDEI, Mason served as the Civic Engagement Coordinator with WVU Center for Community Engagement, where he supported service-based experiential learning at the university. He currently serves as the chair for the City of Morgantown's Health and Wellness Commission. Mason earned both his bachelor's in biology and master's in public in administration. Mason, we're so glad you are here. Thank you. And so let's get started hearing from our panelists. And I just want to begin by how are you understanding and defining civic engagement in the context of higher education today? So I open it up for any of our panelists to respond. Well, I'll go ahead and start first. Um, to me, civic engagement involves asking students to step outside their little silo of living in residence halls and going to football games and actually engaging with the community around them. Uh, that can take a diversity of forms, everything from service learning projects to internships uh, with various agencies or non-governmental organizations. Uh, but this involves the practical uh, application of things that they've learned, as well as learning some of the specific nitty gritty details of how to actually apply the theory and policy that they're learning in the classroom. So to me, civic engagement is a key part of an educational experience. Great, thank you. Would anybody else like to add on to that? Yeah, following that just a little, uh, I think maybe a broader approach of defining what is civic engagement in, in the forefront, right? So civic engagement, I think I take a broad approach of it is kind of any individual action that would benefit the society around you. Um, and so when we look at that in the context of higher education, we look at, okay, what are our students doing in the communities that we serve? What are our students doing in the classrooms? What are our students doing at our football games and soccer games? And town halls and city council meetings. How are we engaging folks, um, not just academically, but as a whole, right? How are we benefiting their experience? And so then in terms of higher education and, and you know how do we define civic engagement within higher education, 
Well, the reason that we are here is to promote the, the people of our state, right? To provide education and resources and training to the folks that we serve. Um, and so those kind of tie hand in hand, right? Civic engagement being individual actions and higher education being to increase uh, the knowledge and resources and ability to do those individual actions. And so I would say, um, you know, kind of coming back to the question of defining civic engagement, I would really say it's just um, the resources and skills and opportunities that, that we as an institution are providing to uh, not only our students, but to all of our stakeholders. Great. Thank you, Mason. Anything you would like to add, Shaniqua, that hasn't been said yet? Yeah, I would love to jump in. And so um, kind of piggybacking on um, what Mason said, when we think about civic engagement, so generally speaking, the definition of just civic engagement, it's the process by which individuals and groups collaborate to identify community issues and to make decisions about those concerns and to take action. And so it's like this three-step process of identifying those issues, coming together to talk and partner with each other to think about solutions and then implementing those solutions. And so when we think about that in terms of higher education or in students, students and our institutions can be involved in each of those steps of that process. Um, we can be involved through research and helping identify issues and, communi and communication. Um, we can be involved by solutions and resources to implement those solutions. That so, um, I think it's this all-encompassing all -encompassing thing um, to kind of better the society or the community. Thank you. Wonderful. And Dr. Shaniqua, I'm going to follow up with you, or Dr. Williams. Um, can you discuss kind of strategies that might encourage more inclusive participation and representation within civic engagement? Yes, I would love to. Um, and so when we think about civic engagement, the first strategy to make sure that our initiatives is specifically on campus are inclusive um, is targeted mobilization. Um, talk to students, recognize what groups of students are underrepresented and reach out to those organizations, to those divisions on campus. Um, we have to understand that engagement work can't be separated from larger cultural, political, and socio socioeconomic context, right? And so there's a lot of things that come into effect when we think about civic engagement and knowledge um, and access. And so for an institution, what we can do is we can have conversations with students, we can have conversations with the community and making sure that we're building that bridge between. Um, and then additionally, I think campus initiatives should be making sure they're recruiting students from these. Um, identify, like I said, identify who is being underrepresented or who's excluded and include them. And so um, I think those are some very clear strategies. Thank you for adding that. And, you know, there certainly is a responsibility that the university and higher ed plays in this dynamic. It's not just falling on faculty that we create these experiences. And so you mentioned kind of targeted recruiting, and I'd be interested if anybody else would want to add, what are some tactics that the university can do to support kind of student desires for community, meaningful community engagement? Does anybody want to add? I think we already partially do that, um, or at least do do that in some areas. And, and so for one example, and, and maybe the most pressing example is service learning courses and service learning experiences um, through our service learning network, you know, students in business that are interested in advertising and marketing and uh, social media campaigns want to do that, then we partner them with an organization, uh, whether it be a nonprofit or a business or some other local um, org to have them do that, right? We, we teach them, you know, these are the steps of engaging your audience. These are the steps on how to um, outreach to folks. And also you're going to work with uh, the Mon River Trail Conservancy to do this, right? You're going to work with the Quora Arboretum to do this. And so um, looking at, at first the interest and passion of students, right? What are they already interested in and how can we tie into that and, and improve that um, but then also on the other side of that, you know, how do we show them what, what they're doing and what they're learning is making a difference, right, and, and has tangible outcomes. Um, one example of this is, is Falling Run Trail. Uh, there, a few months ago, there was a group, I, I know that I've personally worked with them, but there's groups that come in and work with them to help, you know, develop the trail a little bit and build it out and, and make it more accessible and cleaner and safer for folks. 
And for students to be able to say, you know, yes, I learned about trail maintenance and I learned about, uh, you know, water runoff and how to appropriately, you know, set up the landscape, but also like there's a trail in town that I helped build, right? I helped maintain, I did that. And so being able to help their interest and passion, but also show them what, what they do and what they care about matters. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Katkan, anything you'd like to add? Well, I guess I think back to the three pillars of the land grant mission of the university, the research, teaching, and service. Um, the research end is the creation of new knowledge and scholarship. Education portion is uh, communicating that to students. But the outreach, the extension, the service mission is one that doesn't always get it communicated as clearly to both students or faculty. Um, and yet that is one of the pillars that's at the heart of the university. And I think that emphasizing that uh, role and providing the uh, awareness, the academic rewards, the uh, publicity for the outreach and the service portion is got to become part of what the university does. Um, I just learned yesterday that the Board of Governors has launched a public comment period for the hiring of a new university president after Dr. Gee retires next year. Uh, what are the aspects that we should be looking for in a new president? And I think that that might be one of those. That's excellent. Thank you for tying it into kind of the the vitality of our institution as well as also being part of our civic engagement. So you spoke about these kind of formal and informal partnerships. Um, and uh, Mason, you gave the example of the Falling Run Trail. Um, how do you kind of foster these interpersonal relationships and networking to enhance the effectiveness? And please feel free to use an example, either doc Dr. Katkan or Dr. Williams. Um, I can start. So I foster these relationships by honesty, building the relationship, building trust and transparency. Um, and so when we talk about civic engagement and kind of being involved in the community, we have to recognize that a lot of communities, there's a lack of trust um, or there are other structural barriers that are in place. You know? And so um, building that relationship is so important. And so I think about, um, I've done some research um, in South Africa and Nigeria and Ghana. And I went over there to build um, specifically in South Africa some, some workshops to help students become more civically engaged. And a lot of things that we heard from these workshops were the lack of transparency, the lack of trust from institutions, thinking that institutions will come in, do the research or the bare minimum, and then leave these communities without any resources um, or any benefits. And so when we have these relationships and these partnerships, it's important to include in communities in all steps and also to follow up with them. Don't just end your relationship with that community once your project. Keep that line of communication and that relationship. Thank you. That was lovely. And uh, um, there is a lot of evidence or data that's suggesting that our current generation or Gen Z generation is really lacking trust in institutions. OK, so our role as educators is how do we kind of facilitate and redeem some of that trust in our institutions to make sure that we're civically engaging with each other, too. So, Dr. Kakam, any um, example or how you foster relationships? Um, I think it is important to be able to communicate the rewards of civic engagement, uh, that there are both career benefits, there's educational benefits and Personally, I typically find it to be a lot of fun. Uh, sometimes there's some long, boring meetings, but there's also the opportunity to do really meaningful work in areas that we think are important and that cannot be done any other way except through this kind of community engagement. Um, identifying those kinds of rewards and communicating those to students is important to make sure that they understand that there are reasons why they should be 
engaged with their community, that it's not enough to simply um, live in their residence halls and go to the football game and then party with their friends, that there are more valuable aspects to life and to the university experience. One of the things that I tell students in my advising for academic uh, reasons, in addition to the courses they should take and how to improve their study skills is how do they engage professionally? What are they doing to demonstrate that they're getting more out of college than just going to class every day? A lot of these kinds of, uh, whether it be formal internships or volunteering with student organizations or doing work with the community service projects, that's about half of the education that the university offers. And we really do need to emphasize that those benefits are real and that that's why students should be actively seeking these kinds of engagement opportunities. Wonderful, thank you. And I think I like how you reminded us that it can be fun and it should be fun. You know, we can we can enjoy our learning experiences. So Mason, I'm gonna direct a uh, question to you with your background in um, public administration and local governance and engagement. How can students be motivated to participate in local governance and community development initiatives as part of their civic engagement? So I think we've already you know, partially touched on the, the two aspects um, earlier of, you know, it has to be interesting to them, right? They have to have a personal passion and a personal reason to be able to go out and be a part of something. Uh, but then they also, you know, need to see that tangible result. Um, and then I, after kind of hearing folks talk and thinking it through some more and then thinking through this relationship thing, um, I think having, you know, an, an opportunity or a network to reach out to is a huge step, right? I'm not going to show up to a city council meeting if, I'm not super sure what time it is, how long it's going to last. I don't know anyone there. There's not really anything on the agenda that I care about. Like, why am I? Like, if I'm not there, nobody's going to notice. And so addressing that at the core and saying, you know, you're not just welcome here, but you're encouraged to be here, right? We want your voice. We need your voice. And in establishing avenues, I think, for students to get involved. Um, kind of going back to tying in the prior question of relationships, um, I think that the university already has a couple of avenues that um, avenues of relationships that we use and, and can maybe be expanded on and used by students. One being our community partner program. Um, so the Center for Community Engagement does an incredible job of connecting with organizations and um, you know many local governments and, and being able to support the work that they do and highlight the work that they do. And so when a student says, hey, I want to get involved in local government, not sure how, not sure where, well, guess what? We have a partner that can meet that criteria, right? We can we can get you connected. Um, or if it's throughout the state, you know, we have our extension programming where we have at least one faculty or staff member in every county. And these folks are every day working with the people in these counties, um, building those relationships, expanding that network. Uh, being a part of that local government system, a lot of our extension programs are partially funded or totally funded by um, the county commissions. And so kind of building up on that relationship and saying, hey, students, uh, parents, community members, you might not know where to start, but here's an avenue, right? We have this person in this county that can get you connected. Um, and really just opening and, and making as accessible as possible that initial start of getting involved. Excellent. Thank you. And all three of you have discussed in length the the, what, the rich benefits of civic engagement for our students um, and also the focus on supporting our land grant mission, the research, teaching and service mission of uh, many of our educators. And so I'd like to turn it to what are some of the challenges, maybe given the current socio-political context um, that you are confronted with or see kind of coming down the pipeline as it pertains to civic engagement? So what are some of the significant barriers that you have experienced? And this is open for the whole panel. I would say kind of lack of resources. Um, and so being engaged takes time. Um, it takes energy. 
um, depending on the type of engagement that you're engage that you're engaging in, it take it can take money or other resources. Um, and I think that the lack of resources makes it harder for people to be motivated to be. Thank you. I would agree with that. Um, we have a number of students that are single parents or have to work to pay their tuition and put beans and bacon on the table. Um, asking them to take part in volunteer activities or outside assignments is a significant barrier. And we have to recognize that not everybody can engage in that way. Um, for those who do have that flexibility and opportunity, uh, I think that it's useful to have them share some of their experiences and explain why it's valuable. But uh, finding those volunteers and motivating them, uh, getting the resources for internships or outside activities, those can be the real challenge. Thanks. And I think, too, to add on is... Um... I think a lot of framing of how we approach these ideas and how we talk about um, issues that are affecting students and communities. I, I hear a lot of times that all oh, this younger generation, I guess my generation of folks younger than me are, are apathetic, right? There's there's a lot of apathy there. There's a lot of, I don't care. It doesn't involve me. And, and I think that there may be some truth to that sometimes, uh, but I think more it comes down to... Um, we recognize that there's an issue. We are passionate about that issue and are, are willing to work on that issue, but also recognize that the structures in place prevent us from fixing that issue, right? Uh, we can go out and we can vote, but that's one vote amongst many. And, and does that really fix the issue? We can go and attend a city council meeting, but outside of the public comment section, like why, what's the point of us being there? Uh, we can go out and, you know, pick up trash and clean the streets and, and do active direct service. Tomorrow, they're going to be dirty again. And so I think a lot of the times it's not necessarily that it's the issues that we don't care about. It's, it's and I, I say we, I, I'm kind of, I guess, broadly generalizing folks, but um, I, th I think that the discussion comes down to framing whether that instead of the topic itself. Yeah, thank you. Let's continue this kind of conversation. Um, you've mentioned like systems and structures kind of get in the way. Um, what role do you think higher ed plays in kind of ameliorating some of these challenges or um, incentivizing motivation? And this is for the whole panel, Mason. <laughs> Um, Mason talked about this framing issue as well, and I think that higher ed comes into place to make sure that we are shifting the conversation and the focus of these activities. Um, and so I think that we as an institution um, can really provide incentives, course credits, we can provide money, whatever can bridge those gaps to stop that stop students or provide a barrier for students. Um, I think that's where higher ed should come in especially with the land-grant institution. Thank you. Yeah, I think I just echo that, um, you know, especially with this this kind of, I guess, focusing on WVU with this creation of the new division for land-grant um, engagement and, and kind of the work that the Center for Community Engagement does and Extension does and mm -hmm. other, um, you know, uh, units across the campus. I think just reinforcing the there is good work happening and, and that this is how we can go about doing good work. Um, that is really what the role of the university is. Right. I, I would agree, particularly with some of the things that Dr. Williams had mentioned, providing the kinds of incentives so that students feel a reward for their activity is going to be very important. Um, I couple that with the need to communicate to other students what some of those rewards are. Uh, when students do a project with the city of Morgantown and identify energy efficiency savings, it provides real benefits for the city as a whole, but it also, I'm thinking of some examples of students I've worked with uh, 
led directly to some career opportunities. And after they graduate, they have you know, employment in those kinds of fields. Uh, making those connections to other students and telling their story is important to help overcome some of the barriers and the, uh, whether you call it apathy or alienation, I love that comment. Um, making that breakthrough is important and, and communicating that to other students has got to be part of the engagement mission. Excellent. Thank you for those comments. Um, and I'm. it's nice to hear that there's some good aim and direction and maybe those are some great recommendations for the open comment period in the hiring of our new president. <laughs> and so um, our civic engagement often involves, can be fun, has a lot of benefits, but there are also, can, we can face challenges and setbacks. Um, and so from each of your per, 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 sorry, per, per, perspectives, whether it's encountering barriers to political participation, difficulties in promoting sustainability um, practices, or even challenges in local governance, um, how do you encourage students and community members to persevere through disappointments? I'm going to stay, I think, on the framing note. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times with issues, we talk about framing, but I think with um, successes and wins, we can talk about framing as well. Um, there's been, you know, multiple campaigns over the years that I've worked on and you know, spend months or even years working towards this idea or towards this uh, policy that you would like to see changed. And then the vote happens and it doesn't happen. And all of that work was for nothing, right? Like it's over, um, except that it wasn't necessarily, right? Like there were relationships that were built. There were networks that were strengthened. There were skills and abilities and resources that prior to that campaign um, weren't there, right? And so I think a lot of times we talk we need to talk about the wins that happen uh, through what we do. And yes, we might be wanting to do the whole alphabet A through Z, but if we can even just get a few letters here and there, that's more than we had before. Um, and so I think encouraging folks to say, you know, yes, continue to think big, continue to try to change the world, but when the world doesn't change, what did change? What did we accomplish at the end of the day? Thank you for that, Mason, that's wonderful. Anybody else want to kind of add how do you deal with those setbacks? Um, I love that, Mason. I think that was great. Um, I, I, when I deal with setbacks like that, I think I return back to this relation building, accountability, being honest and genuine with the community and with those who are being involved. Um, because things happen, right? We have goals. We want things to happen a certain way, and it doesn't actually go the way we thought. And that's life. Um, but in these relationships, if you're being transparent and you're accountable to how you have, could have done things better or different, um, that in itself is this community building. And as a community, we come together and we can be resilient. And so kind of putting myself in that community and making sure that we all are working together and understand what's going on, um, I think that it goes a long way when our impact or our goals aren't achieved in the way we thought we would. Nice. And much of what I'm hearing too requires a moment of critical reflection. You know, the time to be able to spend with the students or the participants and sit and really process what that experience has been. Um, and in order to make those connections, as, as Mason was mentioning about the relationship building, the accountability skills built, the experiences that were made. Um, how about for you personally, um, this can be hard work. And you've mentioned it takes resources, it takes time. Um, Mason, you put in a lot of effort and you may not get the, the vote that you intended at the end. So how do you kind of work through burnout? <laughs> how do you main, stay engaged and enthusiastic yourself in this work? Uh and this Many years ago, somebody asked me something like this, and, you know, why do we keep doing this when uh, I realized that, A, I enjoy doing it because I meet the most creative, exciting, dynamic people, the ones that I admire the most. They're the ones that I want to be hanging around with. 
um, and B, uh, I actually tend to mostly mostly do the things that I think are fun. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am pretty focused on doing the things that I like to do and some of the things that involve hours of mindless paperwork, I probably at those slip more than I ought to. I would be more effective if I spent more time doing some of that paperwork than I do building trails and volunteering with other things. Um, but I do it because as a volunteer, it's what I like to do. And between the satisfaction of doing things I like to do and the uh, uh, relationships with people who I really admire, um, that's the main motivating force that I have. Wonderful. Um, for me personally, I would say two things, um, balance and humility. Um, and so first is balance of sometimes I get overwhelmed. The work is hard um, and it's draining sometimes. And so I try to make sure in my personal life, I practice and making sure that I'm taking care of myself and those around me um, so that I can continue to do this work. Um, and then humility, I stay humble because sometimes I may not change the entire world. I may not change the whole system. But if I stay humble and take a step back, I change someone's individual life. I made an impact on an individual. I have students come talk to me saying they want to get into political science or whatever it may be. Um, when I'm working in the community, I have community members talking to me about how I've changed their outlook. That's amazing. And no, policies may not have changed. The world may not have changed. But I made an impact on someone's life. And that drives me every day. Beautiful. Mason, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think uh, similarly to Dr. Williams, um, took a, for down a couple words. Uh, one is forgive. I think I need to forgive yourself a lot, right? When something isn't successful, it's not your fault that it wasn't successful. Um, when a program or initiative doesn't accomplish all of the goals that you had initially thought that it was supposed to, uh, it's not personally your fault. And so being able to step back and, and forgive yourself, I think is is a big one. Um, and then also, you know, echoing breaks and, and pauses and what Dr. Williams was saying, of just taking care of yourself. Um, yeah. That is the forefront, right? If you're drowning, you can't prevent those around you from drowning. Um, and then this is like super cliche, uh, but I, I do think of it and I try to refer to it of, you know, uh, President John F. Kennedy's of if not us, who, if not now, when, um, and just thinking of, you know, if I have a reason to not do something, sure. But if I don't have a reason, I don't, maybe I, I just don't necessarily want to talk that through, right? Figure that out and then figure, you know, if, if if I'm not going to go and do this, when who is going to? If I'm not, if not now, then then when, right? Um, and so those three. Great. I'll, I'll follow up with one more thought. Um, one of the more damaging things we might do to students or volunteers is become overly critical if they get burned out or if they're not doing everything we ask of them. And particularly in a volunteer situation, it is important to recognize that everything they contribute is valuable and we should never ever be critical because they haven't done even more. Um, what they've done is better than nothing at all and just be grateful for what we get and don't be overly disappointed if it's not everything we want it to be. Wonderful responses. Thank you all for those. And I, I do want to turn our attention to the chat. There's one question that kind of connects to the current generation and engaging them. Um, it comes from Susie Huggins. And looking at how do we kind of prevent or sorry, promote mentoring, um, considering technology and our generational differences um, and encourage engagement um, around this current day youth. And so I'm just curious if you have some thoughts and this is. You know, this is kind of the last question I had was what are current trends and innovations looking forward, which looking forward engages our current generation. So comments on that question or just kind of the future of civic engagement in your perspectives. Are 
acronym. I was yeah. reading over the question there. Um, I'm going to lead with a plug uh, for the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, in my new role with Youth Protection, um, one of the things that I am going to be doing over the next couple of months, over the next year, is to continue talking about this kind of question, right? Where are youth and how do we engage with the youth and, and what is the kind of uh, guidelines and procedures around that, right? Where do we, uh, where are avenues of engagement and how do we interact with those avenues? Um, a sh short, not really answer, answer, I think is it really depends on the youth that we're interacting with, right? Uh, who are we wanting, to, what, what folks are we looking to engage? Um, are we wanting them to be a part of technology and data and more robotic and, and STEM side of things, or are we wanting them to go and read with uh, the local public library and be more um, maybe literature and, and academic focus? Like, what is the ask? And I think that's where we start. Um, and then from there, you know, or, um, every kid is different, right? Every group of kids is different. And so kind of looking in those structures, um, it really depends, but I, I would love to continue this this question. Um, I just don't have a great answer for you right now. I'd love to hear from the others though. This is an issue that I have tried to wrestle with and I don't know that I've succeeded very well. Um, on the one hand, social media provides really powerful tools for outreach and engagement. At the same time, there are plenty of examples where it becomes isolating, where people become engaged and lost in the, what my daughter called the black hole of Facebook. Um, they, uh, you know, we've heard stories of cyberbullying and all the things that restrict our engagement. And so finding ways to use social media in a productive and constructive way and how to avoid some of the more harmful and uh, isolating mechanisms is one of the things that we need to work on. And I'm really looking forward to someone who's got the answer to that. Um, I don't know if I have an answer to that, but um, what I thought about was just kind of finding common ground. Um, and so we have to remember that. So I, when I think of civic engagement, a lot of times I think of it as in, policy and politics, just because that's the world that I'm in. Um, but I have other interests outside of that and that I could tap into that also align with students. And so, for example, um, if someone is interested in gardening, um, that's a civic engagement activity that you can gather students who are also interested in gardening and start a community garden um, somewhere locally. And so I think that we should find the common ground of our interests and other students' interests so that Maybe in real life, outside of social media, we can kind of build those relationships and those connections. And let students know that, hey, I may not be on TikTok, but we do have some things that align and we have some common interests. Right. And I think just to maybe add to that too is letting the student lead that experience. So to Susie's question is, you know, like, what do you enjoy about TikTok? Who do you follow? Why do you follow them? Um, what are the messages that they share? How does that connect with civic engagement as a different modality of engagement? And so maybe you place the student as the, the teacher and you as the learner. Um, to, to just build that common ground, um, start where, this, where the students have, has the interest, which I think both have been comments made. Um, I just am kind of trying to keep a chat, keep a look on the chat. Are there any other questions in our last kind of couple minutes here with our panelists that are burning questions that our audience would like to ask? Just have some comments. Because I do have, I have one kind of final question, um, and I am curious from each of you, who inspired you to be civically engaged? Where did your civic engagement identity kind of stem from? And that's, you know, one question to either take away, to think about, or we can kind of go to our um, our panel. So... Go ahead, Dr. Um, I had a middle school teacher, um, a middle school teacher, Miss um, Moyd, who I am very fond of to this day. She was at my PhD graduation. 
Um, she was really the person that was like, this, here's the world and here are all the things that are going on in the world. And here are the ways in which you as a person can utilize your resources to change the world. And I mean, she's just like a rock star. And so um, that's definitely the person. Oh, I'm so glad we could honor her and thanks for sharing. Dr. Kakam. Um, I think it started when I was in college and I got involved in this organization mostly for some career opportunities, but there were a couple of leaders that really inspired me to volunteer more and do the next steps. Um, and so I think the role of that mentor, that inspiring either a fellow student or a teacher cannot be underestimated. And that outreach by individual persons is absolutely critical. It Thank does you. not work as a assignment for the whole class. Sometimes Beautiful. it does, usually not. Yeah. And Mason. Yeah, I'd say um, partially program, partially person. So program wise, um, I grew up in, in West Virginia 4-H. And so through that, had the opportunity to to meet folks and, and get those experiences. And that kind of drilled in, I think, civic engagement in my head. But then throughout 4-H, um, met a man, uh, Chad Proudfoot, uh, who worked for the university for a couple of years and is now um, with Virginia Tech. Fingers crossed, it's, it's either UVA or Virginia Tech. Sorry, Chad. Uh, Virginia. Yep, there. Thanks. Uh, I don't know. That's a different link. But yeah, um, I would say Chad. He, um, you know, to me, demonstrated what it meant to you know, be um, a civic leader, a, a civic participant, a civic member, um, and um, continues to do so and kind of helped guide me to get my MPA and to stay with extension and, and yeah. Beautiful. Well, and much like the experiences that you both share, or you all shared um, of how you kind of entered into civic engagement, you are creating those very moments for your students. And I know many others on this call and who will watch this recording are creating those very moments um, to inspire our youth's in identity of civic engagement. So thank you so much for your comments, your insight, your inspiration. And um, let's continue to keep this as a proud source of our institution. Um, thank you. Really, thank you. And it looks like the chat is continuing. So I feel inspired and my gears are turning and I'm wondering if we actually need a part two because there's so much more to be shared. Thank you all for taking the time to be here today and to share your wisdom and your experiences with us. I feel like there were some real practical strategies that we can walk away with today that we can start to implement with our students. And perhaps we'll continue this conversation in the future because there is more to be said. Thank you all for being here. I hope you all have a great afternoon. We'll be sharing this video and any resources that were shared um, in the near future. So look for your emails. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>